Hair care enthusiasts, are you ready to elevate your hair game without breaking the bank? If you are, this will be very interesting to you. Divi will give you an exclusive $10 off discount on all premium hair care products. But to claim this fantastic offer, all you have to do is visit their website at DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174. Whether you're looking to nourish your locks, revitalize your scalp, or want a serum for hair growth that actually works, Divi has you covered. Visit DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174 and unlock your $10 off discount now. In the hollowed echoes of time, amidst the scenes of ancient lore, lies a realm shrouded in mystery and fascination, of which we call Eden. It is a name that moves one to visions of bliss and of paradise, where pristine landscapes embrace immortal beings untouched by sin. But as the pages of the Bible unfurl, casting light upon the shadows of our legends, we find ourselves confronted with questions that challenge the very essence of Eden's existence. Picture, if you will, a world where the whispers of eternity dance upon the breeze, where life flourishes in harmonious union with the celestial rhythms of the cosmos. This is the Eden of our collective imagination, a realm untouched by the ravages of time, where immortality reigns supreme, and where sin is non-existent. Or so we have been led to believe. Yet, as we delve deeper into the annals of ancient scripture, we find that the reality of Eden is far removed from the idyllic paradise we have come to envision. For the Bible speaks not of immortal beings frolicking amidst plush gardens, but rather of a land much akin to the bustling territories of Canaan, a land teeming with life where mortals, and specifically categorized as Gentiles, tread upon its sacred soil. Indeed, the parallels between Eden and Canaan are striking both described within the pages of scripture as fertile lands at the center of an ancient world. And yet, while Canaan is regarded simply as a geographical region, Eden has been elevated to the status of myth and legend, a realm imbued with a sense of otherworldly mystique. But why? Why do we, in our modern age, cling to the notion of Eden as a paradise of immortal beings despite the absence of such descriptions within the biblical text? Is it the allure of the unknown, the tantalizing prospect of a world beyond our mortal comprehension? Or perhaps it is the echo of ancient tales whispered through the corridors of time that stirs within us a longing for something greater, something transcendent. As we stand on the precipice of discovery, gazing into the depths of the mysteries created by traditional religion and popular theology, let us not be bound by preconceived notions or the shackles of tradition. Instead, let us commence a journey of exploration and enlightenment, seeking to unravel the truth that lies hidden beneath the veils of myth and legend. For in the heart of Eden, amidst its fertile fields and winding rivers, lies a story waiting to be told, a story of an enduring quest for meaning and purpose, of an assembly committing themselves to an exodus. And though the truth may elude us still, let us continue to seek, to question, 
and to perceive, for it is in the pursuit of knowledge that we find our truest selves, and in the unraveling of mysteries, and especially of those unsupported by the Bible, that we find our greatest truths. And therein lies the greatest issue, the issue of truth within the Bible. The issue of one exercising mind for knowledge to be found within the Bible. And in all that I present, I'm hoping that you do find, beyond any doubt, not simply knowledge by exercising mind within the scriptures, but the underlying quote-unquote truth within the scriptures. And if I should just leave it at that, that's absolutely vague, and I deserve criticism. <laughs> but what is the definition of truth? Before we jump into this topic, what is the definition of truth? The true or actual state of a matter, conformity with fact or reality, verity, a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle, or the like, the state or character of being true, actuality, or actual existence, an obvious or accepted fact, truism, platitude. So in all that I do present and will, not just now, but from time beginning until time end, the idea of the existence of a concrete, sincere statement of fact within the philosophy of the Bible is what is always going to be presented should the mind and the mindset be there and what is and always will exist. And the idea of Eden, the idea, first of all, of Genesis is an idea that is tricky and that, that is liable to trip the mind up that is not prepared to jump into it in the way that it ought to be jumped into. And Eden is one, Eden is one that seems to disturb many, that causes much disturbance. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 especially, which chapters I enjoy going through because they, they unseal and they have within them the intended philosophy from either Genesis to Malachi or Genesis to the Revelation. The intended philosophy rests in those three chapters. And hidden in those three chapters are the issue. And the issue is placed into an allegorical context. And if not jumping into that, those chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, with that in mind, nothing will be perceived correctly. And the subject of Eden, the subject of the garden, one of my favorite subjects, is one that has to be touched on in a way that is best representing the mindset of the author that's writing them. And when you talk about Eden, when you really look at Eden in the way that it's constructed and in the way that it's set up, it is unmistakable, it is absolutely unmistakable that the underlying fact of philosophy, quote unquote, truth of the Bible, is that this is not the traditional frame, this is not the traditional religious realm that we have come to either accept or believe in or disbelieve in. Lining everything up that the Bible gives us to decode what this actually is, well, we actually see a narrative. We actually see a narrative. And we see the narrative very clearly. Not only do we see a narrative that is very clear, we see a narrative that is repeating a narrative that we don't even need the Bible anymore to uncover. We can just look through history. We can just use our mind. Once we get to that point 
and where the Bible allows us to discover and to go beyond the discovery of the map that it is putting together through the structure of its language and its context in regards to Eden. The trick to being able to understand what Eden is, what Eden represents, is language. Is language. The book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8 reads, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. This idea of planting, if we're familiar with Bible language, if we are familiar with Bible illustration, this use of the word planting should send our mind into the right direction. Looking in the book of Exodus 15, 16, and 17. Exodus 15, 16, and 17 reads, Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm shall they be as still as a stone, till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Eden, like Canaan, was planted. Eden, like Canaan, was planted. Author of the book of Genesis, they do not and they will not give us the illustration of what this planting is. It's absolutely unnecessary. It's unnecessary, one, because the illustrations there, when you get to the language and context of it, tell us of a planting. And as a planting specific to Israel in Canaan. They don't need to tell us this, too, because every point of the scriptures after this point in Genesis the language and the context reveal the actual meaning of what the author in the book of Genesis chapter 2 is talking about. If you're paying attention to language and context from within the Bible, again, Bible in this, it, Genesis to Malachi, Bible. If you're paying close attention to the context of the Bible and how the authors are articulating their position, you do not need to guess at any of the illustrations occurring in Genesis chapters 1, 2, or 3. Bible breaks them down for us. When we're hearing planting, our mind should automatically, automatically go to the Exodus and go to this scene. Because the same sort of context there is the same sort of context in the book of Genesis. Same context, same language. Same planting. Analyzing and contrasting language and context from this scene in Genesis to that scene in Exodus opens now up to us possibilities. Opens up to us avenues. Opens up to us vision. Due to the contrasting. Psalm 44, 1 through 3. Psalm 44, 1 through 3, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in the times of old, how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantedst them, how thou didst afflict the, the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. When we're hearing of planting, a garden was planted. Planted. Eden planted. And we're seeing the illustrations lining up. Not just one in one sense. I mean context. From the Exodus to the Psalms, it's the same story. 
the same story in context matches up with the same story in context in the book of Genesis. We will see. When we're hearing of a planting of a land, when we're hearing of a planting of an host, when we're hearing of a planting, all plantings should take us forward into the notion, into the experience, into the visualization of what took place at the Exodus. Bible lets us know that that host was planted. That host was planted. That contrast cannot and should not be forgotten. Now, if planting in Eden, if planting in Eden, because it says the Lord God planted a garden eastward and there he put the man whom he formed. If planting in Eden, who occupies, and if also planting in Canaan, Eden and Canaan alike. If planting in Eden, like as planting in Canaan, if planting in Canaan, like as planting in Eden, who occupies Canaan? Who occupies Canaan in which that assembly, that host, that congregation was planted? Who occupies Canaan? Acts 7, 44 and 45. The book of Acts chapter 7, verse 44 and 45. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus, Joshua, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. The land of Canaan is occupied by Gentiles. I'm not, that's... Which also our fathers, Acts 7.45 that came after brought in with Jesus, who is Joshua, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. If Israel is being planted in Canaan, if Adam is being planted in Eden, if this planting is a planting of Israel among Gentiles, it's really fair, very fair to conclude, not even assume, very fair to conclude that that Adam was planted amongst Gentiles. The same language associating that planting concerning Eden and then concerning Canaan Within Canaan, there are Gentiles, according to the terms of the scriptures in regarding them. Eden going through the same type of planting, it's the same language. We can fairly conclude that Eden is a territory, is an environment, has a terrain of which Gentiles rule of which are filled with Gentiles. This again allows our thoughts on what Eden is to branch out from the traditional scope. There are not two literal individuals. There is not one literal individual planted within an empty place. That's false popular theology. Eden is a zone filled similarly like as to Canaan. Exodus 3, 7 and 8. Exodus 3, 7 and 8. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. Are we reading? Are we reading? 
are we reading about a territory whose rivers and waters are exchanged for literal milk and honey? Are we reading of a territory whose rivers and bodies of water are exchanged for literal milk and honey? This is figurative language. Figurative language. Milk and honey to this mind that is writing this represents economic wealth and prosperity personally and in society. The land of Canaan was a land of prosperity. Milk and honey equal prosperity, both with body and possibly also with mind, if that's the desire. Ultimately, with body is the main visualization there. Eden was a land of milk and honey. Being planted in a land of milk and honey, as Adam was, is the same as Israel being planted in a land, being planted in a land of milk and honey, as is Canaan. Same visualization, same contrast, same context, same everything. Eden was not an idyllic paradise where where non sinful beings existed and such. That's 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 allegorical perception. The reality is, is that yes, it was an absolute paradise in the same context of Rome being an absolute paradise. It was the same in the same sort of lens as the Achaemenid Empire, the Empire of the Medes and Persians. That was a paradise. It was a paradise in, in the same sense as the USA is a paradise. I mean, to those outside of it. Those within is another story, but looking from the outside in and adding lore and all of that to it, it's a paradise. Paradise. It's a land, I should say in better terms, of privilege. Same connotations that are placed onto Eden, same connotations that are placed onto Canaan. They are both lands of privilege. They are both lands of milk and honey. This isn't literal milk and honey. This isn't supernatural. This isn't uh, supernatural privilege. This isn't anything extraterrestrial. This isn't otherworldly. This is very simple. This is a land of economic and, if you desire, spiritual and educational growth. What is the Sabbath of the Bible? In the Bible Sabbath. You'll embark on a captivating journey through the ancient wisdom of the Sabbath, a day of rest and reflection, as described in the Holy Scriptures. Inside of these pages you'll discover a fascinating exploration of the philosophical significance of the seventh day, insights into how the day of rest can improve your well-being and mental clarity, tips on how to incorporate the Bible's rest into your devotional experience. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to rediscover the essence of your faith itself. Your gateway to a devotional life of peace, purpose, and profound joy is waiting. Get your copy now and embrace the gift of the Sabbath. A land of privilege. Bible lining Eden up with Canaan allows us to be able to look at Eden the way that Canaan is looked at. Eden is a land of privilege, or should I say a pleasant land. Another phrase familiar to the scriptures. A pleasant land. A land of privilege. In what way, though? Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, 
when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. It is the condition of the environment that made it appear to be a paradise. And to the minds back then, everything that here is being stated, wells dig, you dig, didn't dig them, vineyards and olives planted, houses, bustling cities. This is all what is considered, quote unquote, paradise to these minds. We have to remember, if we're going to understand anything from Genesis to Malachi, we have to engage the minds that are active in constructing the things that are therein. That means we have to be them. Not literally. We have to take on their minds. To the minds writing this, everything here stated is paradise. When you have this type of foundation, you can do any and everything. This is Canaan. And Canaan being set up and spoken of as having that Israel planted within it, it's really fair to line that up and to conclude the same sort of Eden and that Adam, which ultimately, whether one wants to accept it or not, this is Bible, which ultimately changes the landscape for how Eden is to de be defined and for how Adam is to be defined. We're seeing that Eden is not a literal paradise. It is a paradise city. It is a paradise environment and paradise according to how it is broken down in the book of Deuteronomy, which is by the mindset of the folks putting these things together. This allows us to understand that the Adam there that was planted that the quote-unquote man there that was planted is playing the same role of Israel. Eden is playing the role of Canaan. Adam, quote-unquote man, is playing the role of Israel. This allows us to understand that Eden, not being a paradise, is a pleasant land, is a land of privilege, and Adam is not a man. Adam is an Israel an assembly, a host. The narrative given in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, Genesis chapter 2, is of an host being planted within a pleasant land, which allows us to know from the narrative of Exodus that planting in the pleasant land doesn't take place without an exodus. This is how we can know that that Adam, being an assembly, had to have gone through an exodus in order to receive the privilege of being planted. It's the same narrative. It's the same story. Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and of chapter 2, which we are now talking about, the author does not have to give us the details needed. Because every single detail that is needed is laced within every chapter of the scriptures thereafter. It is the reader's responsibility, not the author's. It is the reader's responsibility and not the author's responsibility to understand what is going on therein. And that is, when it comes to the Bible, what it seems to be tripping up many. See, our Western culture, which is Greek, it has made our minds sincerely lazy. And it shouldn't have, because the Greek mind is not a lazy mind. But for some reason, our Western educational institutionalized culture has made our minds lazy to where we are supposed to believe that what is written on the page is to give us everything we need. As if what we're reading on these pages of the scriptures is written by the Western 2024 mind, the Western 20th century mind. That's what that seems to be what's tripping us up. The concept of the author not having the responsibility 
but the reader having the responsibility to confide is seemingly foreign, but not, not to the, again, minds that are, that are putting these things together. Further, what is, what, like staying on that topic of what does that mean of how the Bible confides and, and not straying away from the subject at hand, looking in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 17, 2 through 6. Now, this perfectly relays everything that we have been saying. Son of man, put forth a riddle. Speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. Listen to the language. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. What are we reading? We're reading about Eden and what was planted therein. We're reading about Canaan and what was planted therein. We're reading about a system of planting, a planting that takes place among traffic, a planting that takes place amidst merchants, a planting that takes place amidst great waters. This is all figurative illustration symbolizing economic advantage, symbolizing possibly educational, philosophical, mental, and inward advancement, progress, privilege. This is how the Bible teaches. This is how the Bible lines up illustration. This is how the Bible confides to its student what it's actually talking about. When we're hearing of Eden, when we're hearing of the Lord God planting in Eden, when we're hearing of Israel being planted in Canaan, when we're hearing of this eagle planting in a land of traffic, that land of traffic, that fruitful field. This is all a connotation for a Jerusalem. This is all a connotation for a Canaan. This is all a connotation for an Eden. This is the same language. When we're thinking on Eden, when we're thinking on Eden, and when I'm saying when we're thinking with the Bible as our guide, Eden is not in a place of beings and of deities and of human deities and of sinless human deities. That's that's not the, that's not no reality. That's not reality. Far from it. Eden is a land of traffic. Eden is a fruitful field. Eden is a fruitful city. Eden is a fruitful terrain. All of what is said from the book of Deuteronomy in like to Canaan. What was planted in Eden was an Israel. What was planted in Eden was this seed of this eagle, was this seed of this bird, which we are told is a riddle or a parable to begin with, which is what exactly the book of Genesis is, and especially the first three chapters. And not just holding it to the book of Genesis or to the first three chapters, Genesis to Malachi it is a philosophical riddle, is a philosophical parable that has to be understood by the language and by the context and by the patterns, most importantly, by the patterns of the language and the context that is being exercised therein. To the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 9, 24 to 26. Nehemiah 9, 24 to 26. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduedst before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. 
and they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards and olive yards, fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. The, the, the language used for Canaan, it is the same language used for Eden. We really just have to be able to look past the parable and find ourselves let into the riddle. The same language used to describe Israel's planting is the same language used to describe Adam's planting. The same negligence. We don't have to guess about after what happens with that Adam planted into that land, what happens next? We, we know negligence will happen because that's the story. That's how it goes. It's the same scene, the same scene reproduced in figurative terms, in allegorical terms. Same scene. Canaan plays the role of Eden. Eden plays the role of Canaan. Israel being planted in Eden, sorry, in Canaan. Adam being planted in Eden. Adam is playing the role of Israel. Israel is playing the role of Adam. Israel found themselves planted into a land that was pleasant due to an exodus, an exodus from oppression, an exodus from spiritual slavery, written there uh, in a compelling way to connote or promote physical slavery, but it wasn't ultimately physical. It was mental. It was philosophical. It was devotional. What allowed that exodus or what moved, what moved that exodus forward was bondage, spiritual religious bondage with the same story of Eden and Adam lining up to the same story as Canaan and Israel, we can know, we can absolutely know that that Adam is planted just like that Israel is planted in Eden, just like they are in Canaan due to spiritual religious slavery, due to philosophical bondage. One cannot hold the planting of Israel in Canaan without an exodus and an exodus from spiritual religious slavery. One cannot and should not hold that Adam planted in Eden without slavery, spiritual religious slavery, a spiritual religious oppression that is concocted and is fully described from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 details the creation of religious slavery. Genesis chapter 2 details exodus from religious slavery. By Adam, Adam is not a single singular um, figure. Adam is a recurring host. Adam is the kind of host that the narrative fills, which is filled in example by Israel. This is a recurring theme in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are recurring scenes. We don't need the Bible to understand what the recurring scene is. We can just use what we know. It's a recurring scene. The Bible lining up Eden as Canaan lines up Adam as Israel again. If lining them up, we cannot hold this alignment 
without placing an exodus into consideration. Adam is a general kind of assembly that is going to find themselves in an exodus from religious slavery, from spiritual slavery, from theological oppression, to find themselves in an environment fixed that is a pleasant land. This pleasant land is Eden. This pleasant land, this land of traffic, just as Canaan was, is Eden. Eden is not a mythological terrain. The individuals therein were not without error or with not human sin. That's religious error. And it's religious error, error built up by religious heresy to the individuals existing at that time. Just as we can look at any sort of on a surface, nominal sense, religious assembly and believe that there is no sin in them or within their leader, that's how it was for Eden, figuratively. These people were without error. It was a paradise. Not literally. This is parable. This is riddle. This is how human is perceiving human, tricked and duped, by religion. It is what made the people of Eden appear to be wise, appear to be good for food, and appear to be delightful and pleasant to the eyes that created the myth of them and whoever and whatever should be created therein as without sin and as being both God and mankind. False. It's false because the Bible actually tells the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is that Eden, like Canaan, is a bustling environment. However we want to imagine Canaan, that's how we ought to, according to the author of the Bible, the authors of the Bible, observe Eden. Eden is Canaan. Eden is Rome. Eden is Alexandria. What is planted therein is an Israel. In the same sense of Israel being planted into Canaan. The only thing is, is that this Israel isn't called Israel. They're called Adam. This is a same Israel. Different name. Same story. When you get to the underlying ground of absolute fact to the narrative that the authors of the Bible are constructing, they're not painting a picture of a mythology. They're painting the picture of an assembly exiting religious and spiritual slavery and finding themselves in a terrain that is bustling for them to conquer. Same story, same narrative as the Exodus. And because the authors of the Bible line that up to what is there in, Ge in Genesis, there's no denying, there is absolutely no denying what they are actually conveying to us when we get past our traditional thought, when we get past our traditional non-belief, when we get past our whatever, what, whatever is somehow blocking our mentality to let the mindset of the Bible speak. Because when the mindset of the Bible does speak, the portrait is beyond clear.